This is the study session on derivatives and the reading on derivative markets and instruments. Just two readings here, but two of my favorites. <clears throat> Let's go ahead and define a derivative and distinguish bet between exchange traded and over-the-counter derivatives. First of all, let's define a derivative. This is an easy one. Uh, a derivative security is nothing more than a security whose value is derived from the value of another security. Examples include forward contracts and futures contracts and option contracts and swap contracts. And they can be traded in one of two markets. They can be traded uh, on exchanges where there are organized exchanges. They are standardized. We'll talk about how important that is in just a second and <clears throat> probably have some significant or substantial regulation. Over-the-counter markets, on the other hand, are uh, a little bit less standardized, uh, maybe even more customized, and they're probably more lightly regulated uh, than their exchange counterparts. How about the uses of derivatives? Well, there's essentially three, three things, and this is true for, for investments in almost any kind of a financial security. Um, the first way is to hedge. And what hedging does is it enables the investor to reduce or substantially reduce or even possibly eliminate certain kinds of risk. Speculation occurs when there is the hope of a gain. Of course, we're speculating, um, but of course we could lose, right? So speculation. And then arbitrage is uh, really one of these fascinating things um, uh, that, that can occur, doesn't always happen to occur, but there's still, there are arbitrage opportunities uh, where an investor simultaneously buys and sells an asset to take advantage of difference in prices, maybe on different exchanges, maybe in different geographies, uh, maybe in other kinds of differences. Um, but essentially what you do is you buy something for 100 and you sell it for 101, and a lot of times you do it immediately, and a lot of times there's no risk, and a lot of times there's no required investment. All right, types of derivatives. How about, uh, how about forward commitments? This is an obligation to engage in a transaction in the spot market at a future date. But the key part here is that those terms are agreed upon today. So you agree today to trade something in the future. And these include things like forward contracts and futures contracts and swap contracts. So this is a forward commitment. This is an obligation. So when you enter a forward contract, you are obligated to do something in the future. And most of us have entered forward contracts when we bought a house, right? You go to the bank and you sign the, uh, you sign the loan agreement today and you lock in at that fixed rate, let's just suppose it's five, you know, 5%, you lock in that rate, but you don't get access to the capital. You don't buy your house for another 30 or 45 days or however long it takes. So that's an interest rate forward contract where you lock in the rate and other kinds of forward contracts that are common are currency forward contracts. But then the other type of a derivative is a contingent claim in which, in which the outcome is determined by the value of the underlying asset and it's or, or maybe it's conditional on some event occurring and these are options and credit der derivatives and even asset backed securities but let's take the simple example of an option contract you know i could agree to buy a share of stock at a hundred dollars in the next six months and um, that contingent claim depends on what the spot price of that share of stock is i mean if that share of stock by the time the option expires, increases to say two or three hundred dollars in value, and I have the right to buy it at a hundred. Well, that's a positive contingent claim. But if the price falls to ten or twenty dollars, then why would I pay a hundred dollars for something that I can get in a different market for twenty dollars? All right. The command words in this uh, in this uh, reading. Uh, sound an awful lot like define. So let's go ahead and define all these things. A forward contract is an over-the-counter derivative contract in which two parties agree, whether it's on, on an interest rate like we did with our, our mortgage loan or uh, uh, a currency forward contract in which we agree to trade a currency at some point in the future. Now, of course, 
there is no capital that changes hands today. All the two parties are doing, the buyer and the seller, are really, you know, just kind of shaking hands and agreeing to trade at some time in the future. And that could be six months away or, you know, 12 months away. It could even be a week away. Um, so either party, either party can default. And so that's considered a default event. But now remember, these are forward contracts. So these are legal and binding contracts. So if one party, party reneges on the commitment, then the other party can sue. Now, futures contracts are really fascinating uh, securities. What they are, in, in their basic form, futures contracts are nothing more than standardized forward contracts. You know, back here, when we talk about a forward contract, uh, if we're a farmer, what, what we could do is that we could say, you know what, we're going to plant corn today, and in four months, we're going to harvest our corn, and we're going to have 100,000 bushels of corn. And so we enter a forward contract to sell that 100,000 bushels of corn at a, at a specific price, say $3.50 a bushel. Well, lots can happen during the course of that three months, right? There could be lots of weather, there could be theft, there, there could be all sorts of things that go, uh, that prevent us from harvesting exactly 100,000. But look, we signed that contract to deliver a 100,000 bushels of corn. And if we can't do that, that's a violation of our commitment. And that's the big problem with forward contracts is that they're tailored to meet the needs of the individual buyers and sellers. And as such, that must mean then that forward markets have very little, if any, secondary markets. Ah, and that's why in 1848, there were 12 or 15 guys from Chicago who got together and formed, uh, you know, the, what's currently known as the Chicago Mercantile Exchange. But back then, they said, you know what, the only thing that... that that's not working in the forward market is the fact that these contracts are not standardized. So a futures contract is really just standardized. And the exchange determines the size, the size of the contract, the underlying asset, the, uh, the maturity dates of those contracts. And there are some good examples. I mean, there are really just, there's so many futures contracts out there. Uh, there are stock index futures contracts like the S&P 500. Uh, there are fixed income futures contracts like the 10-year treasury note, but there's also a treasury bill and a treasury bond futures contract. And you can buy futures contracts on oil and gold and, and almost anything that, uh, that the exchange thinks would have some kind of popularity. Now, these are standardized. So if you want to either buy or sell corn on the futures exchange, well, you have to agree to buy or sell in increments of 5,000 bushels or 1,000 barrels of crude oil, or 42,000 gallons of gas, or I think it's 110,000 board feet of lumber. And so each contract has its own standardized amount. Now, the way, the way that these things work on the futures exchange is that the exchange takes the opposite position for every trade. And so uh, if you and I wanted to agree to trade uh, gold at some time in the future, let's say six months, and we, agree, and we agreed on a price, well, what the exchange will do is it will write a contract to me and it will write a contract to you so that if one of us wants to get out, then the exchange can sell it to somebody else. And this makes for tremendous amounts of liquidity. And that's the big advantage of futures contracts over forward contracts because they're highly liquid, they're highly marketable, and you can get in and out of them at almost at any time that you want. Another reason that these are so popular is and, and so marketable and highly liquid is because of the system of marking to market. And this is where we have daily settlement, where there is actual cash settlement. Profits and losses are exchanged at the end of every, di every day. The long and the short position change cash throughout every day. And of course they do it with the exchange, not, not with each other. For the great example of the daily settlement, please go watch uh, Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd in Trading Places where they shorted orange juice futures contracts because they had some inside information. And the two guys who, who they were trying to bankrupt, Duke and Duke Securities, 
they lost all their money, hundreds of millions of dollars. And at the end of the movie, they come out and say, turn these machines back on. But the exchange executive says, you know that we settle accounts every business day. That's called daily settlement. How about swaps? Swaps are really, really cool instruments. This is an over-the-counter derivative in which two parties just agree to exchange a, a series of cash flows. And this is how I, I always uh, I give this example to my students. I say, let's suppose that you live in a house and you have an apple tree in your backyard and your neighbor lives in a house and he or she has a peach tree in his or her backyard. And every day you go out and you pick an apple and you eat an apple and your neighbor picks a peach and eats a peach and you do this over time. And after a while, you look and think, boy, I'd like to have a peach. And your neighbor says, boy, I'd like to have an apple. So you agree to swap. And that's really all a swap contract is. But of course, financial swaps, I'm pretty sure there's not really an apple for peach swap contract out there. But a swap contract on an interest rate is going to be determined based on interest rates, right? That makes perfect sense. So we might swap a fixed rate for a floating rate. We may swap one currency for another currency. And so you see these are cash flows. With peaches and apples, you don't really have cash flows. You just have hunger pains. And options are the coolest of all these things here. These are uh, derivatives that gives the owner of the option the right but not the obligation. That's important. The right but not the obligation. In all these other contracts, there's an obligation. You have you have the obligation to trade at some time in the future. But an option gives the owner the right, but not the obligation. What that means, what that means is that the owner of an option on the expiration date of the option can do nothing. Imagine if you had an option to do nothing during the course of your life. Like, well, I don't really feel like getting out of bed and going to work. You could just exercise your option and just lay in bed. Or you could be at the beach and you could say, you know what, I want another week at the beach. I just want to lay on the beach and do nothing. And of course, we have the right to buy. That's a call option. The right to sell. That's a put option. And we're going to agree on a fixed price. That's called the exercise price or the strike price on or before the expiration date. Two different kinds of options. There's an American option, which is uh, can be exercised at any time up to the expiration date, but European options can only be exercised on the expiration date. And there are options on shares of stock. There are options on indexes. There are options on oil and gold. And, uh, you know, there could be options on anything that the financial services industry thinks would have a demand for it. How about asset-backed securities? We did this in our fixed income study session. These really are nothing more than a pool, right? If let's suppose we're a financial institution and we have $100 million worth of mortgage loans that we've made, those are our assets. And so we pool those together and sell those. We can also do it uh, with some of our receivables. We can do it with royalties. We can do it with leases. And what happens is that we sell that pool, not just as one pool. I mean, if it's $100 million, worth of these asset-backed securities, we're not going to sell them $100 million to one institutional investor. What we're going to do is we're going to slice them. Remember, we called those tranches in that previous study session. And we divide the tranches into different kinds of payments. And so tranche one might get uh, all of the interest payments and the first prepayment. And the last tranche is going to get some interest payments and maybe the last prepayment. So you see what happens here is that each tranche has its own unique kind of risk. And so what this tranching does, these asset backed securities, is it allows investors to gain exposure to that particular kind of an asset like a loan or a credit card, but it allows them to buy the slice that it prefers. Going back to that policy statement, remember our goal as financial analysts is to match the client's risk and return objectives with the portfolio. And so an asset-backed security has great potential. Now, futures contracts and options trade on exchanges and forward contracts and swaps and asset-backed securities trade over the counter. Uh, how about purpose of and maybe controversies, uh, purposes of derivatives market. So here, here's the big one. Uh, 
Uh, this is for risk management. What you can do is that you can either hedge or speculate. What the hedging does is that it will reduce or eliminate certain and specific risks. Remember what I said to you guys in a previous, a previous reading that the goal in all of this stuff is to identify the risks, quantify the risks, and then manage the risks. So we've identified them, we've quantified them, you know, fixed income risk or equity risk uh, or alternative investment risk or whatever that risk is. Now we're going to use derivatives to manage. And so what we can do, I want you to think about the portfolio that looks like this. So we have a portfolio that looks like this, that consists of fixed income and equity and maybe some alternative investments, right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to lay a derivative on top. So we layer the derivative, you know, somewhere along that pie, and we're going to eliminate or reduce, substantially reduce certain kinds of risks over short time periods. And you can also think of uh, this as an insurance need. But the other purpose, and this is really cool as well, the purpose of derivative markets is for price discovery. I mean, think about it. If you want to bear, buy a share of stock today that sells for $100, you're betting that the price goes up. You pay $100 today, let's forget about margin accounts, you have to pay $100. You're out $100 in capital, right? But you could find a call option on that share of stock and you might only have to pay $1 or $2 or maybe $5 or $10, so substantially less you're still going to benefit when that price rise. So you get the sense there that it's the same bet, both buying the share of stock and buying the call option benefits when the price of that underlying share of stock goes up. So it's essentially the same bet, but what it does is that it allows investors to pick and choose which bet they want to make. So there are substantial increases in market efficiency and price discovery, boy, we're figuring out, we're trying to span the entire financial environment we're spanning so that we're going to allow investors to provide input so that we discover what is a better true price of a share of stock. And of course, derivatives, because they use leverage, um, they're a lot cheaper than buying a share of stock. So they're reduced transaction costs and the use of leverage. But of course, these are not perfect. If you listen to the politicians after the 2008 uh, financial crisis, and many of them blamed these risky derivative securities. So they are complex and they might be too much for unsophisticated investors to handle. And there's no doubt, there is no doubt that this is a gambling technique. You don't have to own the underlying asset to go into the derivative market and you can lay all your money, you can lay all your bets down and you're essentially gambling on the price of the underlying asset. Now, the flip side of that gambling is that it can encourage speculation. When you read about, oh my gosh, here are six men and women and, and they made a trillion dollars trading swap contracts and you think, oh my gosh, that's for me. And so it might encourage speculative trading. This is somewhat of a concern with hedge funds. Uh, arbitrage. It exists when equivalent assets or combination of assets sell for two different prices. And so what you essentially try to do is you try to buy in the lower market and then sell in the higher market. And here's the analogy that I, I like to use, at least uh, least more recently. My, my dad loved to watch uh, shows on TV about building. And so there's a show called, I forget what it's called, but th what these people do is they bid on abandoned houses or building structures. And they typically get to bid, you know, four or $500 or $600 or whatever it is. And what they have to do is they have to tear the building down and then they can use whatever they get. And there was some guy on there, one show, who found, you know, there was, there was some lumber in there that was hundreds of years old. So he paid 500 or $600 for this structure, took it down and built another house over here and charged, you know, $500,000 or whatever it was. I mean, that's not really financial arbitrage, but you have an asset that's worth more over here than it is over here in the, in the financial markets. Um, arbitrage involves selling at a profit with no risk. And that's the important part there. Now, this law of one price that we learned back in our economics days is really important here. If there are lots and lots of arbitrageurs out there who are buying low and selling high by taking advantage of inefficiencies, well, what they're going to do is they're going to drive those prices together. What happens because of this law of one price and arbitrage is that essentially 
if we have an efficient and competitive market, it's almost impossible to make a risk-free profit. But nevertheless, you have lots of really smart men and women that have access to capital and they have tremendous computing capacities. They're out there trying to search for these arbitrage opportunities all the time. So due to their work, we can be assured that markets are relatively efficient, fairly efficient, highly efficient. I don't know. Pick your word there. And that takes us through the first part of this derivative study session. Uh, next up, we'll get out our calculator and do some pricing.